Most NFL pundits don't expect the Seahawks to be competitive in the NFC West. If the team's going to exceed expectations, which players have the power to make or break their 2022 season? Rob Rang and I are going to be discussing and debating on our latest installment of Locked on Seahawks. You are Locked on Seahawks. Your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings 12. This is Corbin Smith, your host for Locked On Seahawks. Joining me as always, my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. Thanks for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. This is a four-episode week, just like last week. We had this 4th of July holiday, a lot going on. So we appreciate you coming back and listening in. We're going to be back with an episode every single day the rest of this week, and we'll be back to five episodes a week starting next week. So glad to have you on board. We're going to be taking a look at some make it or break it candidates for the Seahawks going into the 2022 season. Which players have the power to lift this team beyond expectations? Plus, we're going to continue our 90-player countdown with numbers 50 through 46. This episode is brought your way by Bet Online. Bet Online is he covered this season with more props, odds and lines than ever before. Bet Online where the game starts. Now for your lead story here on Locked On Seahawks after a 3-day weekend, some exciting news coming for the Seahawks courtesy of Jody Allen, the chair, not necessarily labeled the owner, but took over as the chair of the Seahawks after her brother Paul Allen passed away in 2018. She's been pretty quiet on the ownership front. There's been a lot of speculation, growing speculation at that, about the Seahawks and the Trailblazers, who are also owned by Allen's estate, being put up for sale in the near future. And today, Allen released a statement, Rob, and I'm going to read through it, and then you and I are going to have an opportunity to kind of dissect some of the things that were said. But this was a statement put up on the Seahawks social media today. As chair of both the Portland Trailblazers and the Seattle Seahawks, my long-term focus is building championship teams that our communities are proud of. Like my brother, Paul, I trust and expect our leaders and coaches to build winning teams that deliver results on and off the court and field. As we've stated before, neither of the teams is for sale and there is no sales discussions happening. A time will come when that change is given Paul's plans to dedicate the vast majority of his wealth to philanthropy, but estates of this size and complexity can take 10 to 20 years to wind down. There is no preordained timeline by which the teams must be sold. Until then, my focus and that of our teams is on winning. And again, this is from Jody Allen, the chair of both the Trailblazers and the Seahawks, being posted today on the Seahawks social media Rob, really, this isn't a surprise. And, and I think for a lot of people, if they're really reading this close, two things become clear to me. One, the Seahawks are not for sale right now. Two, they're going to be for sale at some point down the line. And as she mentioned, maybe it's 10 to 20 years. This doesn't necessarily feel like a situation, though, where Allen is just jumping, chomping at the bit to sell this team or the trailblazers at that. Maybe one of these teams gets sold sooner rather than later, but it doesn't sound like she's in any hurry to do that. And it's a complex deal when you're trying to sell a professional sports franchise. Oh, yeah, it's an incredibly complex deal, Corbin. But at the flip side, in a way, it's very simple. Basically, Ms. Jody Allen just put a for sale sign up. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think that uh, that we're not – we shouldn't expect there to be any type of real action on that front for a couple of years. Uh, there was a report by the Sports Business Journal uh, and that, that basically said that the state of Washington um, would receive 10% of the funds uh, if, if the Seahawks were to be sold before May of 2020. That was an article that was written by Ben Fisher, again, of the Sports Business Journal back in mid-June, June 16th. Um, and, and so I, I think that, again, this is basically what Ms. Jody Allen is doing here is that she's putting the, the putting potential buyers on notice that, that this is a club that, that perhaps could be available. Same thing with the NBA's Portland Trailblazers, of course, both the two franchises that the late great Paul Allen um, owned. Um, and, and so, again, I think that to me is, is the big news here is, is the big, uh, you know, news that is drawing the oohs and ahs from all of the, the Seahawks fans out there there who maybe didn't get enough of that over the, the, the 4th of July weekend. And as you said, Corbin, a, kind of a belated uh, 4th of July um, 
uh, holiday to to all of our listeners. And thank you, as always, for joining us. But again, to me, th this is the big news, is that the Seahawks will be eventually up for sale. But I don't think that that's anything that anybody needs to worry about as far as is the team going to be relocated or anything like that. Uh, I, I think that this is just the way that the world operates nowadays. There's obviously only so many people out there, only so many organizations out there that have the, the pockets deep enough to own an NFL franchise. And if you are going to announce to the world that you have one of those franchises that might be available at some point, this is how you do so in the modern age. Yeah, this really feels like Jody Allen kind of pulling out the stick and poking the bear a little bit like, hey, we're not for sale, but... You know, we might be if you open up your checkbook. That's the way that I took it. I don't think that this is going to be happening anytime soon. And as you mentioned, uh, the Sports Business Journal 2024, that deadline was put in place when the new stadium was built. And basically, yep. it is to protect against relocation, for one thing. If you sell mm -hmm. the team before then, hey, we're going to take a chunk of that sale, 10%. And so I don't expect to see the Seahawks sold anytime before then. Maybe after that point, five billion, five and a half billion. We just saw the Broncos get sold for over four billion dollars. So again, not many people in the world have the pockets. Not many organizations have the pockets to buy an NFL team. But Jody Allen kind of making it clear with this statement that we're going to remain competitive as long as I'm in charge. The goal is to win championships. I'm going to hold on to the team for now, but I'm going to be selling at some point. And I'm going to echo what you said. I know a lot of Seattle fans. As soon as there is a sale with a major sports franchise after what happened with the Supersonics going to Oklahoma City, I can understand the hesitation and the fear with the Seahawks getting sold and the wrong owner buying and deciding, you know what, I've got a bunch of estate down in a certain city called San Diego and San Diego doesn't have a team now. Maybe I'll move my team down there. You know, I can see why there'd be some hesitation from fans, but I would not expect that that is going to happen. This is a market that's proven. It is a very strong sports market. You've got an outstanding fan base. The Seahawks have won a lot of games here in Seattle. It's a very profitable team. So I don't see whoever buys that franchise deciding, you know, I'm going to pack up and let's go get a stadium somewhere else. And I think that you will see some local people that are going to have a lot of interest in buying this franchise when that time comes. Again, I don't think it's going to be anytime soon, but certainly I would think that Seahawks fans have nothing to worry about when it comes to losing their team. I agree with you, Corbin, and for all the reasons that you just uh, dis discussed, so I, I won't uh, re repeat them. But um, yeah, I, I just think that just from a human geography perspective, where people are moving in this great country of ours, there's so many uh, people and dollars moving into the beautiful Pacific Northwest region that I just do not think that there's any likely uh, possibility, really, not even likelihood, but possibility that the Seattle Seahawks would be moving somewhere else because that just is too lucrative in, in this region. So yeah, while it is a little bit disconcerting because there are a lot of Seattle sports fans out there who have been burned just like sports fans from, from far too many other cities in our sports landscape in this country, the money hungry sports landscape in this country that we have. Uh, so yes, there are some, C some Seattle fans out there who have been burned, but yeah, I think that the Seattle Seahawks are going to continue, whether it be Miss Jody Allen as the owner or somebody else years down the road i do believe they will remain the seattle seahawks and, the, and they will be playing their football games there uh, in seattle and this is such a big area such a big market that the seahawks contain we know the distance between seattle and every other team you would have the portland markets idaho you've got uh the rest of the oregon market northern california even this is a very large area that the seahawks kind of own hawaii even so I just don't see any of the NFL to me would step in and they would stop that. If a new owner tried to move the Seahawks, it's not going to happen. So fans don't have to worry and they shouldn't have to worry about the team changing hands, at least for the next couple of years. Jody Allen should maintain the chair position at least through 2024, 2025. Maybe at that point there might be a sale pending, but for now, nothing on that front. We're going to get back to our 90 man countdown. It feels like it's been about a month since we last visited that countdown with our last five players, but we're on numbers 50 through 46. Rob and I are going to be diving in on all five of those players coming up here in a moment. 
BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including Major League Baseball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sporting and wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. And BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline, where the game starts. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, Tuesday edition. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Joining me as always, my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. Thanks for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. It's been a few days since we last picked up from our 90 player countdown, but we now are at the midway point today, numbers 50 through 46, a lot of linebacker flavor and special team standout flavor in today's show. And we're going to start off with one of my personal favorites on the Seahawks, Rob, coming in at number 50, the goofy, hilarious, hardworking, versatile Nick Ballore. All the aforementioned characteristics fit Nick Bloor. We're talking about a guy that was undrafted at Central Michigan, and now I believe this is going to be his 12th year in the NFL. That by itself is a remarkable story for a guy that has been a linebacker. He started some games at linebacker in the NFL. He's played fullback. He's went back to linebacker. He's one of the best special teams players in the league, at least when it comes to covering kicks and punts. He forces fumbles, and he's such a electric personality, somebody that teammates gravitate to. So while Nick Ballore is not a superstar and he's a guy that's actually been cut by the Seahawks a couple times coming out of training camp in the preseason before, those were just moves that were made to ensure that he didn't have a guaranteed salary for the year and they needed to have him come back. I anticipate that Nick Ballore is once again going to be one of the key players for the Seahawks on special teams. He's going to be a key guy in the locker room. And I think he could even play some snaps in a pinch for you at linebacker. I don't expect to see him much, if at all, at fullback in Shane Waldron's system. I don't expect to see very many fullbacks playing. If they do have a second guy in the backfield, probably going to be one of their tight ends. It may very well be one of their tight ends. Uh, and I'm happy that you mentioned just the, the way that Shane and Waldron's offense is, is different uh, than, than some of the schemes in, in which uh, Nick Ballore has been able to carve out a spot. Um, you you kind of, you know, extolled his virtues there uh, pretty nicely. And one other word that I would jump, I would throw out there is just dependability. I mean, this Nick Ballore, along with that versatility, um, along with that, that just the charisma, um, you know, the, similar to the way that Luke Wilson had it on offense in the, t- in the tight end room for Seattle, just kind of kept everybody loose, kept everybody having a good time. One of those locker room guys. That's what Nick Ballore uh, has and brings brings to the table. Um, and, and so, so I think all those things are incredibly important, especially when you're talking about a young, and I know the Seahawks hate using the term rebuilding, but let's face it, that's what they're doing here. And so you'd like to be able to keep veterans like that. But at the same time, again, because we're not likely to see that traditional fullback role, because Seattle does have the youth at the linebacker position that they are going to have now. I think that Nick Ballor is right now, certainly firmly on Seattle's roster, but You kind of talked about how the fact that he's barely hung on to this roster. I think that he's going to have to barely hang on this time as well with, again, a lot of young, speedy, unfortunately so far at times, injury-prone linebackers nipping at his heels. I do think one thing that's working in Ballor's favor, and this is a perfect segue to the next player on our countdown, there are two young linebackers coming back from torn ACLs for the Seahawks. And so I think that his ability to play there and actually play at a high level. I, I think some fans, they don't realize how good of a linebacker that Nick Ballore actually is. He made a lot of tackles for the 49ers back in 2016 when he started 10 games for them at linebacker. And I've seen him on the practice field. This is not this does not look like a guy that's just jumping in to play linebacker because, oh crap, we have nobody available. He can play the spot. Is it ideal for them to play him there in an NFL game? No, but he certainly is capable of doing so. And I think you look at the injuries for a few of these players, including Ben Burkirvin coming in at number 49 on our countdown. And he's obviously a very popular player in the Pacific Northwest because he racked up tackles in bunches playing for the Washington Huskies. He has a nose for the football, a very smart, high football IQ guy, very underrated athleticism coming out of Washington, but he's not very big. And now he's coming off a torn ACL. He had another operation, a minor one, 
that he underwent earlier this month that might prevent him from being able to participate early on in training camp. And it just feels like last year he was already on the bubble before this injury. And now you got to wonder coming off of reconstructive knee surgery with some of the other young players that they have at the position, whether or not his roster spot is necessarily safe. If he's not able to show he's healthy, that's obviously going to be a deciding factor right in itself. But I think even if he makes it back healthy, there is no guarantee he makes this football team because there just are enough questions, particularly how is he going to fit in as a 3-4 inside linebacker at his size? I think that is a big issue to think about with his skill set. A big issue indeed. Yeah, I mean, it really is. That was the biggest concern I had about BBK coming out of UW a few years back is just, did he have the size and physicality necessary to, to physically hold up and against the, you know, the gargantuan players that you see in the NFL. And that was in a traditional four, three scheme where he's got two defensive tackles ahead of him. Um, you know, typically taking on those blockers and allowing him some freedom to be able to make some tackles. I mean, he, he rocked up some of those big numbers, Corbin, at University of Washington, in part because he had guys like Vita Vea and Greg Gaines, a couple of Morris Trophy award Shelton. winners in front of him. Exactly. Uh, Danny Shelton, yeah. I mean, you know, the, you know UW has such a, a strong history of strong men in the middle. Um, and so that's the thing, is that Seattle, you know, the Seahawks certainly have those players as well. But in that 3-4 alignment, he is going to be asked to take on those uh, guards, those fullbacks, a little bit more often. And, and I just don't know if that's the game that, that really matches up very well with BBK. And that's presuming that he is healthy, that he has regained that speed that was absolutely eye-popping. You you mentioned the instincts. You mentioned that he's an underrated athlete. I mean, Corbin, this guy, 230 pounds running in the 4 4 I mean, that he's absolutely unbelievable athlete. Um, and, and I'm very much rooting him on here just because of the local uh, aspect of it with the Huskies as well. But at the same time, you do have some real reservations about his schematic fit um, coming off the injury we talked about before. He's got a crafty veteran and Nick Ballor right ahead of him. Um, you know, I, I really think that Seattle is going to have to make a decision between one or the other. Typically, the younger, cheaper player is the guy who's going to get it. But uh, at the same time, he has to prove that he is physically up to the task. Now, speaking of proving to be physically up to the task, I think this next player here at number 48, that's a good starting point with Tyreek Smith, the fifth-round pick out of Ohio State, because we're talking scheme fits here. Tyreek Smith was a 4-3 defensive end for the Buckeyes. He hasn't played that 3-4 outside linebacker, that hybrid linebacker role, where he's consistently going to be dropping back into coverage, and he hasn't played way out wide very often. So... That might leave some to pause, and yet I'm actually far more optimistic about his ability to be able to do this, even with him being a guy that ran in the low four eights. He doesn't have blazing speed, but there's enough other athletic traits and enough playmaking ability. He's one of those guys that just looks like he moved faster in pads and a helmet. You can see it on the Ohio State tape. I'm actually more optimistic about his long-term prognosis playing that position. I actually wonder if he might benefit from this change in a lot of ways because I thought the biggest problem he had at Ohio State, Rob, was against the run as a defensive end. I just felt like he got overwhelmed by Big Ten tackles in the run game. I think having him out wide, playing more in space, setting the edge, he is going to be a better run defender by default. And I think he's got better burst than many people realize as a pass rusher. I think there's enough athleticism for him to develop in coverage too. So while I don't know if he's going to be able to carve out a role immediately as a rotational rusher for this team, I do think he arguably has a better skill set for this than what Alton Robinson does. And we'll get to Alton Robinson later in the series. But I do wonder if Smith actually matches up fairly well with this scheme, even though there are some reservations for many out there. I actually am pretty curious about how he's going to make this adjustment. I am as well. Um, you know, I mean, Tyreek Smith is uh, is a talented guy. Uh, you know, a 6'4", 255 pounds. He's got long arms. He's got better initial quickness than than his 40-yard dash in the 4'8s would suggest. Uh, he's got some lateral agility to him, some ability to kind of weave his way through, through tight spaces. Um, at the same time, he does not locate the football 
quite as well as you'd like. And so that's that would be my biggest concern is that if you're going to be asking him to drop back a little bit more and play in the edge, play in space, then he's got to uh, pick up where the football is a little bit faster than he has been asked to do in, in the past. You know, as you said, Ohio State basically just asked him just rush the quarterback, and and he that resulted in some big plays, but just not as much consistency uh, as you'd expect for a player who, with his physical gifts. But again, Ohio State is absolutely loaded with players. You just talked about University of Washington, all their defensive linemen. My goodness, the Buckeyes, they're, they're as loaded as it gets. And so I think that there is a part of that too. There was a lot of almost plays for Tyreek Smith. And so considering some of the talent that Seattle has on their pass rush, I think that Tyreek Smith, kind of like you mentioned with Alton Robinson, might be able to kind of surprise. So I think that's going to be kind of a fascinating uh, you know, battle between those two players who, again, have talent uh, but have struggled with consistency. When we're talking about surprises, one name that I have thrown out in a couple earlier episodes, including I think it was last week when we talked about the right tackle battle, Stone Forsythe is a name that is now gaining a little bit of traction on that front. I'm not going to sit here and say that I think he is going to start against the Broncos at right tackle in week one, but I'm also not going to sit here and say that that's impossible because this is only a second-year player, and you and I know the upside that Forsyth had because we've seen what he did in the SEC playing against top-notch competition, a lot of really good future NFL players rushing off the edge. He's very athletic for a man of his size at six foot eight, a little over 320 pounds. So he's got a lot working for him. He's gotten stronger this offseason. Andy Dickerson was raving about his technique improvements, which I think that was the big thing that going into the league, especially with leverage, that's always going to be an issue when you're as tall as he is. But He's attacked those deficiencies, and so I'm really excited to see what Stone Forsyth can do in training camp. We, have, up to this point, have not been able to evaluate the offensive line because they haven't been doing contact. Once the pads come on, Forsyth is going to be a player that I'm going to be circling and watching closely because, as I mentioned last week, I almost wonder if this could turn into a two-horse race at tackle but with two different players than we anticipated, and maybe Kerhan's getting more of a look at guard because Forsyth has that athletic ability and that length that they covet at the tackle position. So I do think he has an outside chance to be a big surprise in that competition and maybe, just maybe, push Abe Lucas for that starting job at right tackle. Yeah. Yeah, I think that he absolutely has an opportunity to do that. Um, you know, we, of course, the vast majority of his time at Florida was that left tackle position, but he did play right tackle earlier in his career. Um, you know, one of the concerns I had, uh, you know, about Stone Forsyth coming out of Florida is I thought that he was a big man that played smaller than his size. And that's never a, a good thing when you're going to the NFL, of course. Um, and, and so one of the battles I'm looking forward to is actually against two guys who are going to be competing literally against each other, not necessarily for the same roster spot. I want to see Stone Forsyth, Stone, Stone Forsyth and the pass rusher who I expect to be Seattle's most physical this year, and that being the free agent addition, Nicheno Nuosu. And from a size perspective, the 6'8", 325-pound Forsyth should be able to absolutely control the 6'3", 255-pound, roughly, Nuosu. But I am telling you, that is going to be a slugfest. And, and that is going to be one of the ones that's really going to show whether or not Forsyth has developed that technique, as you mentioned, that Dickerson had kind of pointed out, as well as the toughness. He's going to have to be to prove that he can take a punch to the jaw. Uh, you know, and, and still be able to, to to recover from that. That right tackle position, Corbin, as you well know, is, is arguably the most physically demanding of the offensive line position just because of the size and physicality of the defensive lineman that you're likely facing there. Um, and so Forsyth is going to have to be able to show that toughness. Otherwise, he is going to be labeled the way that a lot of scouts label him coming out of Florida is just a left tackle kind of a guy because he just didn't have the physicality to play on the other side. I'll have Nuosu versus Forsyth circled when I'm watching one-on-ones yeah. come August. I think I, I'm 100% with you. That is going to be a great litmus test for him because that is something Nuosu brings to the table that a lot of fans maybe don't realize. Yes, he's athletic. Yes, he's got burst, but he plays with a mean streak, and he plays a physical brand of football. So Forsyth, you better be able to match because if you can't do that, you can't play right tackle in the NFL. That's just the reality of the situation. Capping off our last ranking here, number 46 in the backfield. The Seahawks have undergone significant transformations at running back. We don't know what's going to happen with Chris Carson. 
Ken Walker the third coming in as a second round pick. Rashad Penny re-signing. So with Walker and Penny being in the fold, one's left to wonder where does DJ Dallas fit into this mix? Because there's been some positives. There's no question about it. He's been a very good special teams player. He's returned kicks a few times for the Seahawks. Last year was their primary kick guy in a number of games. And so he's got that experience. He's played kick and punt coverage, has gone down and made some tackles in each of his first two seasons. On offense, we've seen the soft hands out of the backfield you'd expect from a converted receiver to running back. He improved last year in pass protection after a tough rookie year in that regard. And I thought we saw a few glimpses of what he could do as a ball carrier. I thought he played tremendous. He spelled uh, Rashad Penny in the game against the Rams in week 15 in the second half, and he really took over that game on their one touchdown drive, and you saw the physicality, the low center of gravity, the, a little bit of wiggle to go with it. You saw the complete package, but we just haven't seen that enough when he's gotten his opportunities. So I'm left to wonder if this is truly a situation where Dallas is ceiling at this point is as a three, a third down back that is going to play special teams. I just don't know that he's a feature guy, especially now with Ken Walker being brought back or being brought in as a second round pick and Rashad Penny re-signing as a free agent. It's tough for me to see this kid becoming a feature back in Seattle unless there's a bunch of injuries in front of it. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Uh, you know, I think the DJ Dallas is a legitimate NFL back. I just yeah. don't think that he is a top 30 back, a, a guy who is going to be a starter, you know, for every club. I think that he is a kind of a back that, that can make every club because of all the different uh, skills that, that he offers. You, you mentioned the hands, the physicality and pass protection, the versatility on special teams. He's a good interior runner, a good exterior runner that you don't, you don't see that very often. He doesn't have elite speed, but he has enough straight line speed to obviously be able to create some big plays uh, for Seattle as a runner and a returner, um, you know, over his NFL career, as short as it is. At the same time, he just doesn't have that wow factor. There's not a lot of times where you watch him make someone miss or leap over somebody or put somebody on the backside the way that Rashad Penny was able to outrun angles, the way that Chris Carson was able to put people, again, on their backside with that type of consistency. And, and so I think that he is kind of the perfect changeup to the other backs that Seattle already has. But there's no question. Seattle drafted Ken Walker in the second round because they're anticipating that he's going to be able to come in and compete for, if not, starting minutes immediately then certainly strong strong number two minutes and that obviously is going to make things a lot more difficult on guys like dj dallas and travis homer uh you know josh johnson to be and you know and, and again chris carson to be able to make the backhand of seattle's roster when we come back next we're going to shift gears looking at the big picture here which players have the power to potentially make or break the Seahawks 2022 season. We're going to look at some offense, some defense, maybe some special teams players wrinkled in there as well. Expect some discussion and debate coming up next year on the Locked on Seahawks podcast. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models. It's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Why choose to spend 30, 50, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership? Rock Auto is a family business serving it do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every single customer. They've got everything you could possibly ask for, whether it's brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, even new carpet. Go explore their easy-to-use website today to find the solution to your auto part needs. Visit rockauto.com right now and see all their parts available for your car or truck and write locked on in their how'd you hear about us box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, Tuesday edition. I'm Corbin Smith. Joining me, my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. Thanks for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. And make sure for your second listen to check out the Locked On NFL podcast. Our national NFL experts and insiders keep fans dialed in with the biggest stories and the latest news from around the league because an offseason doesn't equal a break in the action. The Seahawks are entering the 2022 season with pretty low expectations. There are a few analysts out there that are differing. 
like Lewis Riddick of ESPN, it thinks the Seahawks could be a sleeping giant. There are a few exceptions, but for the most part, with Russell Wilson now in Denver, Bobby Wagner in Los Angeles, some of the other major changes that this roster has undergone this offseason, most analysts think the Seahawks are going to have a down year. Expectations are really low. So that leaves open the question, which players have the power to potentially shift that narrative and put it on its backside? Which players, if they come out and have a better than expected season, could have the ability to have the Seahawks in the driver's seat, maybe not for a playoff spot, but at least be competing for one later in the season than expected? Rob, let's start on the offensive side of the football. Guys that could make or break the Seahawks season. And I'm just going to throw this out here right now. We can talk quarterbacks because that's obvious, but I think you and I would both agree that for this team to be good this year, yes, they're going to need decent quarterback play, but they're going to need the rest of the roster to elevate this team rather than just the quarterbacks being way better than expected. Yeah, I mean, we, we've had enough conversations about Drew Locke versus Geno Smith that I, I think let, let's dig a little bit deeper there. Um, I, I think that uh, if we look at the way that Seattle's roster is constructed, the way that they that they are success way, rate in terms of uh, the win loss and in terms of statistics, in terms of happy fans, uh, when Rashad Penny got rolling a year ago. Um, then, then Seattle really was a very dangerous team. So I would say both Rashad Penny and Ken Walker, just Seattle's ability to run the football court. But I, I think that if they can be one of the top five uh, most effective running football teams in the NFL next year, and I think that they can do that just because I think that that is going to be a big focus of their offense, then I think that that is going to be something that is going to, again, allow the Seahawks to be a bit of a change up to the way that most of the other teams in the NFL are running, and that is going to allow them to carve out some victories. So I, I would say Rashad Penny and Ken Walker are being huge, huge players that have enough star power to them that if they did wind up having a spectacular season that could vault Seattle a team that I already said before I think that this is a club that's probably going to be going in six and ten six and eleven type of a season but if they are in fact a top five Russian team next year I think that they're going to be very much in the playoff content uh, playoff contention I'm going to go to the outside and DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett expectations are always high for those two even with Russell Wilson now being in Denver. These two guys are two of the top 10 receivers in the league, in my opinion. So having them on your roster is going to heighten the play of your quarterback, regardless who's there. But to win in today's NFL, you got to have three receivers that are really good. And D. Eskridge still has the talent and the ceiling to be a true difference maker. And I think his skill set, what makes him the perfect fit for this particular question for the Seahawks to get by without Russell Wilson, they're going to need another receiver to step up who can create on quick passes, who can get involved in the run game. You can get the ball out to you on screens and can break tackles. After the catch has not been a strength for the Seahawks for a number of years. Some of it's just been because Russell Wilson throws the ball downfield a lot, and that negates some of those opportunities. But Drew Locke or Geno Smith, whoever's playing quarterback, you're going to need an outlet out there that you can quickly get the football to and just let the guy make plays. D. Eskridge has that kind of talent. We saw it at Western Michigan. We saw it at the Senior Bowl. This is a guy that's got a really strong lower body that can get the ball, and he's got to burst quickly to get into the second level, third level, make guys miss, break arm tackles, and then he's gone. He's got that type of playmaking ability. Last year, a concussion really slowed down his entire season. We never really got to see him get going. He's had a few minor nagging injuries this offseason. If you can keep him healthy, I still think D. Eskridge on offense and as a returner on special teams can be a difference maker that can maybe change the tide for a few games for the Seahawks. And that's all it takes. If you win a few games you weren't supposed to win, you can be in the playoff hunt. D. Eskridge, to me, is that kind of a player. Now, going to the defensive side of the ball, Rob, Obviously, Seattle's got a bit more seniority on that side than they do on offense. There's a lot more proven stars. You've got some rising guys like Jordan Brooks. Who, in your opinion, is the player that has that type of make it or break it power for this team that if he has a big year, really breaks out, could help the Seahawks exceed expectations? 
Well, I, I think that one of the obvious candidates to, to mention would be the linebacker, you know, whether it be Cody Barton, whether it be BBK, whether it be whoever it might be, um, you know, anybody who is going to be playing up against Jordan Brooks, um, just in this defense, they, they really should be able to post very similar numbers to what Bobby Wagner has done the last couple of years. And I don't mean that with any disrespect towards Bobby Wagner, um, but just the, the defense is going to funnel a lot of action towards those two inside linebackers. But while we saw Wagner put up absolutely eye-popping tackle numbers, the lack of tackles for loss, lack of impact plays, that's the reason why I'm not going to focus in on a linebacker here. I'm not going to focus on a defensive back because we've seen some unbelievable all-pro all caliber play from Quandre Diggs and from Jamal Adams at times as well. And that's why I'm going to kind of go back to Jamal Adams and the pass rush. Seattle's struggles with the pass rush a year ago, I think, went hand in hand with their inability to play any type of consistent coverage downfield. I think if Seattle is able to get a much more consistent pass rush, then everything else is going to kind of work itself out. Same way with the running game on offense. And so I, I think that the guy is Daryl Taylor. He is the player who I fully expect to lead the Seahawks in sacks. I thought that he was very close to becoming a star a year ago. At the same time, similar to the point that you made a moment ago, Corbin, about the wide receivers, we expect big things at DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. Thus, why we could and we need to see something more from a guy like D. Eskridge or Noah Fant to really put the team up on a whole different pedestal than they were previously. Same thing here on defense. I expect Daryl Taylor to be productive. I think that they need to have something from Nuosu or Boye Mafe are the two who I really think have a chance to really put up some surprising numbers. Yeah, I expect the 10 kind of sack, uh, 10 sack kind of a season from Dale Taylor. But I think you need another seven and a half to eight to nine type of sacks from the other end. And that's why I'm going to be looking more at Nuosu and Boye Mafe to be that type of player that could put Seattle in playoff contention if they did have a splashy first season in Seattle. This is going to feel like a broken record for our listeners because I think if I go back and look at who I picked for this particular segment this time a year ago, I picked Marquise Blair and I'm going to do it again because Marquise Blair, when he has been healthy, has been a difference maker. There is no denying that. And he can do a number of different things. You have plenty of reasons to be excited about Sean Desai and Carl uh, Scott having Marquise Blair as a third safety, a slot corner, however you want to term him, the ability to have him on the field with Jamal Adams and Quandre Diggs. They've wanted nothing more than to have those three guys playing extensive snaps together, and they just haven't been able to do it. With Adams' injuries, with, with Blair being in, injured the last two years, having knee issues, they've not had many chances to see these three guys play. But if you were in training camp two years ago, you saw what those defenses looked like when they had all three of these players in the field and just the flexibility that Marquise Blair gives you. You can blitz him. You can play him in the box. He can play free safety. I think he's more comfortable in that free safety role than Jamal Adams is. He's got more versatility in that regard. He's a guy that can come up and stick you in the run game. He can play slot corner. He can play against big tight ends and coverage. I mean, you have so much flexibility in your nickel and dime sets, and I think you're going to play a ton of nickel and dime in this defense with Clint Hurt, Sean Desai being involved. Desai loves running three safety sets anyway. That was a big part of his scheme in Chicago, part of the reason they had some success getting after the quarterback. They were playing sets that gave them flexibility to help their pass rushers up front. Marquise Blair, to me, can be a big part of that. There's so many ifs here because he's coming off another injury. He hasn't participated in offseason program. But I still believe that Marquise Blair can be a huge difference maker for this defense. Maybe not as a starter, but as a guy in sub packages that can come in and make those impact plays that you've talked about with like Bobby Wagner. This is a guy that can go out and make those type of plays for you in a number of different ways. So I still got to say Marquise Blair is a guy that could really swing things positively in Seattle's favor on defense at least if he is healthy and is able to stay in the lineup. Real quick, one last name I want to throw out on special teams. We've talked Jason Myers a lot. Kickers hold a lot of weight when you're talking about win-loss records if teams are playing in close games. And Myers did not have a good season in 2021. But it's an even year. 2018, he was a Pro Bowler. 2020, didn't miss a single field goal. It's 2022, baby. So Jason Myers, to me, I expect Seattle's going to be competitive. They're going to play in a lot of close games. Jason Myers is an X factor that could make it instead of going seven and 10, 
that you end up winning nine or 10 games if he is able to return to 2020 form and make most of his field goals. So Jason Myers absolutely has to be on this make it or break it category too. No, excellent points on, on both Marquise Blair and Jason Myers. I, um, I I do think that the easier route to Seattle surprising some of those naysayers is, again, being very productive in the running game and boosting the, those really ugly sack numbers. But there is no question about it, Corbin, that uh, Marquise Blair is an absolute playmaker. That's what, you know, from a scouting perspective, kind of makes your mouth water with just, uh, you know, his – uh, ability to make big plays. And then, yeah, with, with Jason Myers and those close games, there's a lot of head coaches out there who believe that the easiest way to turn around a sub 500 team into a playoff contender is just to rebuild the special teams units. And for as good as some elements of Seattle special teams were a year ago, Jason Myers, unfortunately, didn't live up to his end of the bargain. But as you said, this is an even year. So it, it'll be interesting to see if Jason Myers is able to do exactly that. As always, we greatly appreciate you making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. You can follow me on Twitter at Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang. Coming up on our Wednesday episode, we're going to have our latest What If segment, taking a look back at a topic previously in Seahawks history, how things might have played out differently if there was a different outcome. And we're going to continue our 90-player countdown. We've also got a special episode coming up Thursday. I'll be breaking down more of what to expect on tomorrow's show. You won't want to miss either episode. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Go Hawks.